Now, in 1942, there was the Betis Hanger strike in Kent. The government intended to take control of the mines again, to try and end this, this industrial strife during a time of global conflict. But the government also, however, decided to fine 1,050 miners between £1 and £3 for taking part in a wartime strike. Miners across the country downed tools, and the government was forced to back down or face the collapse of coal production in this country. In December 1943, 10% of all conscripted young men were sent to work in the coal mines, the so-called Bevin Boys, as the coal mines had lost 36,000 workers during the war. Now, it was incredibly unpopular to be a Bevan boy, uh, particularly with people from the, uh, from the upper classes who thought they might be infantry officers. It's also incredibly difficult, dangerous work. But 48,000 Bevan boys are sent to work in the coal mines. There are other reasons for, the un for it being unpopular to be a Bevan boy. Uh, if you were conscripted, you had the right to return to your pre-war job. Uh, after the war, but not if you're a Bevan boy, only if you're conscripted into the armed forces. In 19, oh, they're also very unpopular, it has to be said, with the uh, with the coal miners, the who support that they were dangerous to be around because they didn't know what they were doing, they didn't share the same culture, and so the Bevan boys arrive in coal fields are don't want to be there and are hated, and are not happy with their conditions. But it was important, Bevan felt, so that people from all over the country and from all walks of life, could see what it was like to be a coal miner. Now, in 1944, in Wales, there was a wave of unofficial strikes over pay. Miners were now, on average, getting £5 a day. Factory workers, however, got £6, 10 shillings. The government gave in, and miners' pay was improved. And in 1945, the MFGB became known as the NUM, the National Union of Miners. And so after the Second World War, in 1947, the Labour government nationalised the British coal industry. The National Coal Board was set up to run it, although the smaller coal pits stayed in private hands. The government also repealed the 1927 Trade Disputes Act. The 1950s were generally a better time to be a coal miner. But in the 1960s, creeping inflation led to declining living standards once again. Now, I've, uh, I've married into the family of a, of a coal miner. My father-in-law was, uh, was a coal miner at, uh, at Calverton Colliery during the, the great coal disputes. And so, you, hence why I have to be very careful when I, uh, when I talk about, uh, about coal. But if we stop to think about the Calverton Colliery, the Calverton Colliery was the first new coal mine sunk into this country after the Second World War. And uh, as you all know, because they were in Nottingham, uh, the Notts coal fields led the way in mechanising British coal mines, replacing pit ponies with an underground transport system, which was soon electrified. The Forsby pit at Edwinstow was the first all-electric powered coal mine. And it was also the first coal mine to produce over one million tonnes of coal a year. You might say, why is this being mentioned? Well, it's a local deviation. But also, the fact that the Nottinghamshire coal mines are more modern and more productive than most in the country will become significant when we start to look at the miners' strikes of the Thatcher era. Now, the miners, however, even in the good times of the 50s, are consistently underpaid and undervalued. On average, wages were 3% lower than in manufacturing. As the decade progressed, there were more and more unofficial wildcat strikes. Thousands of poorly paid miners felt excluded from the national prosperity. The period saw rising living standards, rising home ownership, foreign holidays and mass consumption for others but not for the coal miners. 400 pits were closed, and 420,000 were made redundant. The only way the NUM was able to stop more closures in areas in particular like South Wales was to put in lower wage claims consistently. But in 1969, 
an unofficial strike led to massive investments once again in the British coal industry, finally slowing the rate of pit closures. And the NUM started to become more militant. They learned that strikes had started to get them some of what they wanted. The new not coal fields were also being opened up at the start of the 70s, particular Cockgrave and Beavercot. People came from Scotland and the North East. As pits were closed in Scotland and the North East, they came to mine in Nottinghamshire. The Coal Board built new housing estates in Cotgrave, Ollerton, and, and here, uh, Calverton. Also places like Clipston and Forest Town. The new coal-fired power stations that were built along the River Trent seemed to guarantee the future of the Nottinghamshire coal fields. In 1917, the NUM voted for a 33% pay rise to bring them close to the pay of factory workers. Just over 50% voted to strike, but the union rules required over 66%, and so it was to be an illegal strike by their own union rules. But they had had over half vote for it. Now, unofficial strikes began in Wales and the North. The Heath government had just brought in a legal limit of pay rises to 8% to try and control galloping inflation. So it was disastrously timed. The NUM changed their strike ballot threshold, changed their rules, reballoted, and in January 1972, the strike began after the Wilberforce Commission. Arthur Scargill led the Barnsley Area Strike Committee. He was a committed Marxist to the left of the NUM and wanted to bring down the capitalist system. He developed a system of flying pickets to blockade power stations and coal depots. 40,000 miners picketed 500 sites, reducing ele electricity output in this country by 25%. The Salt Key Coke Depot was then shut down in Birmingham, causing chaos across the country. The Heath government was ill-prepared for the strike and backed down giving the miners a 27% pay rise. And in 1973, the oil crisis gave the miners a new opportunity as the country became more dependent upon coal once again. From 1973 to 74, there was a winter strike with coal-powered power plants began to run low on coal, so the government was forced to declare a state of emergency and a three-day week. Inflation was running at around 27%. And in 1974, a new coal field is set up to try and create enough coal to provide this country's electricity needs with a new Selby coal field being created. The 70s continues to be a time of strikes, of industrial dispute, galloping inflation. And so you need a big pay rise just to be able to stay still with prices rising so quickly. And from 78 to 79, there's the winter of discontent. The unions critically lose support of the people. For those of you who have not heard of the winter of discontent, uh, everybody pretty much goes on strike, including famously the grave diggers. So dead bodies were left unburied. The army had to try and provide clean drinking water. If rubbish wasn't collected. You'll find be able to easily find pictures online of Trafalgar Square full of rubbish because there are no collections. And it's because pay, the pay is failing to keep up with galloping inflation. You need big pay rises to try and cope with the inflation. But the problem is that Britain has so many unprofitable industries that are being supported that's causing this inflation. And so the pay goes up, which means that the value of money goes down, the prices rise, so you now need the pay to go up again, but the industries are, get, are struggling to pay these higher wages. The British economy is in a mess in 78 and 79. And people stop start to stop supporting the unions really for the first time since the Second World War. In 1969, 60% of the country said the, that they were broadly positive about the unions, whereas in 1979, only around 20% were broadly positive of the trade unions, and the country voted Thatcher into power.